you've been on the internet for any significant amount of time, I'm sure you've heard the term creepypasta used at some point or another. And no, this isn't some weird spaghetti dish or anything like that. Creepypastas are horror related legends or images that have been copied and pasted around the internet and basically just spread around. These theories are often brief, user-generated, paranormal stories intended to scare, frighten, or discomfort readers. And while over the years there has been a decline in creepypastas, I figured I should go over some of the bigger ones that have been around for some cartoons that I've watched, and I'm sure that a lot of you guys have watched as well. Ed, Ed, and Eddie. This theory posits that the kids who inhabit the cul-de-sac are actually dead in reality, and that the lives that they lead actually take place in almost like a purgatory-like setting. According to the theory, the children of the Colossac each come from different eras spanning from the early 1900s to the early 2000s. This would explain why the year of the show is very hard to pinpoint with multiple anachronisms present and also why there aren't any adults in the show. Although sometimes you get a glimpse of one of them, but it's not very often at all, basically. The kids' neighborhood kind of looks like it's uh, early 2000s, late 90s, but Rolf obviously has a ton of old farming stuff. There's just a bunch of old stuff. According to the theory, Rolf arrived first from the 1900s. The theory goes that his family moved to Peach Creek in order to establish a farm on their land. Rolf died around 1903 when his family's farm animals stampeded and trampled him. This was the supposed reason as why he only had one cow, one goat, one pig, and a couple chickens. And basically, he ended up in the cul-de-sac in the afterlife. Johnny 2x4 came to the cul-de-sac not too long after Rolf's death. Having no friends, Johnny took a marker and drew a face on a piece of wood and dubbed it Plank. Though such behavior is considered unusual in modern times, it was considered simple childhood innocence and whimsy in his time. He died in 1922 after fighting a long battle with tuberculosis six years before the discovery of penicillin. He took his friend Plank with him to the afterlife since it was the last thing he saw in life before he died. Purgatory would also explain Plank's occasional sentient behavior which is most notably demonstrated in the Ed and Eddie movie. Eddie came next. He was born in New York, but eventually moved to Peach Creek during the Great Depression. Always trying to get a quick buck, he always sets up scams to get money from the kids in the cul-de-sac in an effort to escape the poverty that he spent most of his life in. Get out there and make me some cash, paper boy! Eddie didn't have a proper father figure since his real father abandoned him and his mother shortly after he was born. Basically, his dad did. With this came the big bro that he adored and idolized so much despite his abusive nature. After one of his scams went awry, Eddie was chased by the kids of the cul-de-sac and ran into the lake and basically jumped in it. Eddie ended up drowning in that lake and soon he joined the other deceased children in the afterlife. Even though he was no longer alive, Eddie still tried to chase the almighty dollar by continuing to basically scam people in the afterlife. Ed and Sarah were next to arrive at the cul-de-sac. Their father had died fighting in World War II and as a result, their mother became distant and very disconnected. To cope, Sarah developed her bossy attitude trying to fill the role that her parents used to fill before her father died and their mother just stopped caring. Conversely, Ed shut the world out and delved into the fantasy world of comic books and monster movies, which exploded in popularity during and after World War II in order to escape his unhappy life. They both died in a freak car accident in 1953, thus joining the other kids in the afterlife. Nas was born in 1960s era to hippie parents. Described as a flower child, she was a rather flirtatious young girl who would always act that way towards the male children in the neighborhood. In the summer of 79, a serial killer ended up escaping from a local asylum and made his way into her house and basically assaulted and killed her and her whole family. And that is one of the worst ones on here. Like, I mean, Eddie's and stuff is pretty bad, but bro, Nav, Nav's got that terribly, like she got done so dirty. Double D was born in the 70s when preparing to attend college from a young age became the societal norm expectation and was raised by very strict, controlling, and emotionally distant parents. They pushed him to succeed academically and to be perfectly clean and neat. He is believed to have died as a result of a gas leak causing an explosion with the Bunsen burner from his chemistry set. Kevin was born around the early 1980s. He was born to a broken down house and he also had an abusive father who was poorly educated and his mother had passed away when he was only one years old. Because of his situation at home, Kevin would act out in frustration uh, towards the other kids in the cul-de-sac, becoming a bully to cope with his repressed anger. His fascination with his bike fits right in with the extreme sports and the birth of the popular X Games in 1995. One night in the winter of 99, his father fatally beat him in a fit of drunken rage. He died while he was on his way to the hospital. His father was convicted of uh, murder and was actually sentenced to life in prison, apparently. Like, this is all, remember, this is all a creepypasta. This is like... None of this is confirmed, to be honest, so you gotta think it, but hey, it's fun to think about. When Kevin entered into the afterlife, he reimagined his father as loving and that he would shower him with gifts. He still kept bullying in the afterlife, though. I don't really know what that's about. 
Jimmy was the last child to enter the cul-de-sac. He was born in the early 1990s and was diagnosed with leukemia. He never associated with the other cul-de-sac children because his parents believed that he was way too frail and weak to be around the other kids and he remained bedridden for the remainder of his life because of this. After fighting a difficult battle with his leukemia, Jimmy eventually succumbed to his illness and soon the cul-de-sac purgatory was complete and apparently all these kids were basically here. The Kankers were from another neighborhood of children. Um, it is believed that they are actually demons that were sent to the cul-de-sac to torment the souls of the remaining children who didn't cross over into heaven and just remain in purgatory. The Kankers are the only characters with normal colored tongues, which would seem to indicate that they are not dead and that therefore they must be something could like basically different surprisingly the cankers obviously they're into the heads so who knows however one common guess is that they are the weakest willed children in the cul-de-sac because they each identify as a different deadly sin now alternatively there's a different theory for the cankers um the cankers are also believed to have been from the same era as naz in the 70s and they were poor illegitimate hippie children from a single mother and numerous unknown fathers out of madness, desperation, and dabbling in fringe cults, their mother killed them and then herself in a grisly family murder-suicide, which rocked the nation as much as the Manson family killings. Only able to majorly see the happier side of their former lives, and with an attachment to wanting to see their fathers again, this is why their lives in the cul-de-sac is similar yet with unfortunate endings. There is a twisted degree of insanity to their attachment with um, basically them living in the cul-de-sac. Their love for the Eds in this theory is explained by them wanting to experience love and be enlightened and transcend themselves, ignorance, insanity, and everything. Basically, they're, they got some daddy issues and they're trying to find it within the heads is what this theory is kind of getting at. Now, we're going to go through some of the points that they try to prove or they say could lead to this theory being real. But again, this is all just a theory. One is that the children have green slash blue tongues and the tongue, in fact, does turn a bluish shade when you die. There is a strange lack of adults or even other kids besides the main crew. The summer is endless, at least in some of the earlier seasons, that's kind of proven to be wrong later because they do have episodes in school a minor yet notable pointer from the movie is where lee canker is depicted as a giant imposing figure in the sea and then flames up to her waist theoretically this is supposed to be um, rooted in some type of european christianity and it's supposed to represent satan i guess but like i said that's all the theories so we're moving on to the next one the rugrats and the theory goes that the rugrats babies were really just a figment of angelica's imagination up first is Chucky. Chucky died a long time ago along with his mother. That is why Chaz is a nervous wreck all the time. Tommy was a stillborn. That is why Stu is constantly in the basement making toys for the son that he never got the chance to basically meet or live with. The DeVilles had an abortion. Angelica could not figure whether it would be a boy or a girl, thus creating the twins. Now, as for all grown up, Angelica was a bipolar schizophrenic who, as a teenager, became addicted to various drugs, bringing her back to her childhood, thus creating a world in her mind that she obsessed over. Because of the time lapse between the present and the last time she interacted with her imaginary world, she made them all older. Angelica was constantly taking hits of acid so she would never have to be without her creations. To her, her creations were the only company that wouldn't judge her in the entire world. Now, Angelica's mom actually died of a heroin overdose. Angelica had schizophrenic disorder because she was a crack baby. Additionally, Drew in his depression married a gold digging whore. <laughs> and <laughs> this is listen, I'm reading I'm reading this, okay? You can't you can't be too mad at me. I'm not the one putting this out there. This is just what is out there. Like I said, this is all just a cartoon theory, a rugrats theory, if you will. Please, I'm not I'm not I'm not calling this guy's wife a, a whore, dude, or a gold digger. But I just think it's funny when I read it. Anyways. Let's get back to it. As I was saying, Drew in his depression married a gold digging whore whom Angelica idolized as a high powered businesswoman because she fooled herself into thinking that it was actually her real mom. However, she always had a concept of her mom, Cynthia. She used it as a Barbie doll to mirror her birth mother's image, wearing an unwashed orange dress and half basically messed up hair. Later in life, she also followed in her mother's footsteps, dying of an overdose at age 13, where all grown up supposedly got canceled. Now, the only rug rat that wasn't part of Angelica's imagination was Tommy's baby brother, Dill. However, Angelica did not know the difference between Dill and her creations. Dill did not follow her commands, and after endlessly crying and a refusal to disappear like the others did when Angelica was angry with them, she ended up hitting him. After she hit him, he basically started screaming, and Stu ran in, pulled his niece off his only child, but it was too late. Dill actually had a brain hemorrhage, which resulted in a deformation. As Dill grew up, his damage only became more evident, and by the time he was 9 and all grown up, he lived as an outcast, being ridiculed for his weirdness and retardation. 
The immense guilt over this is what caused Angelica to start using drugs and to uncreate the Rugrats briefly until her experiences with hallucinogenics. Chaz lost his mind after the death of his first wife and was in denial that she was ever a prostitute. On a trip to Paris to find love, Chaz fell in love with a hooker named Kira. He was originally going to marry a different hooker, but just wanted him, uh, that hooker basically just wanted him for his money apparently. Kira once had a daughter named Kimmy and the baby was torn from her to the law due to her cocaine addiction. Angelica imagined Kimmy from Kira's constant stories about her. Upon returning to America, Chaz and Kira married and she ended up getting her green card. It was a surprisingly happy and romantic story. Kira continually struggled with addiction but was relatively happy with her new life with Chaz. Now Susie was Angelica's only friend who entertained the thought of Angelica's creation because they seemed to make her happy, so she was a real one. She later became a psychologist and teamed up with Nickelodeon to make the Rugrats. When Angelica died of an overdose, Susie helped arrange her funeral. Because of her addictions and her mental state, Angelica was expelled from society, which led her to break with reality and her eventual death. She spent the last days of her life in the back of the school cafeteria, imagining friends around her and playing with the lives of her creations. Supposedly, this is the entire story for Rugrats. Um, that would be crazy if it was. I think it's just got to be a troll, though. I mean, you're talking about Chaz's gold digging whore of a wife. Um, just a bunch of gold diggers in this entire story is pretty crazy. But yeah, anyways, moving on to the last entry for this video. Now, SpongeBob actually has multiple different theories. It has like five or six. I'm only going to go through a couple of these. Um, the ones that I thought were the most entertaining or the most interesting. The Seven Deadly Sins Theory Some fans believe that Spongebob's friends represent the seven deadly sins. There is some debate, but the best fits for each of the sins are as follows. Pride is Sandy. Pride is a deep satisfaction derived from one's own achievements. Sandy is deeply proud of her home country, her athletic abilities, and her career as a scientist. Greed is Mr. Krabs. Greed is a selfish desire for something, especially wealth or power. Now, Krabs fits this in perfectly, obviously. He's obsessed with money, and he doesn't want to share any of it. Okay, he's a, he is a hoarder of money. I mean, he's got money everywhere in his house, under his bed, everywhere, dude. The guy's literally a money grubber. Like, that's all he does. Give me back them toys, you freeloaders! Lust is Pearl. Lust is intense sexual desire. Pearl is depicted as being boy crazy and obsessed with this male fish boy band. I forget the actual name of their band, but is it Boys Do Cry? Is that the song? Envy is supposed to be Plankton. Envy is an insatiable desire. Plankton is deeply envious of the success that his rival Mr. Krabs has achieved, which is obviously why he's always trying to steal his secret formula so he can kind of get his hands on that. Gluttony is supposed to be Mrs. Puff. Gluttony is the overindulgence of food and Mrs. Puff is known to adore food from chocolate cake to pasta and she's fat. Now Wrath is Squidward. Wrath is uncontrolled feelings of anger and hatred. <laughs> Squidward hates his life, his job, his neighbors, and practically everything else about Bikini Bottom. He just hates it all. And Sloth is Patrick. Sloth is excessive laziness. Patrick is ridiculously lazy. He's unemployed, lives under a rock, and basically just sleeps all day until SpongeBob comes around. It's also been suggested that Patrick or Gary could also fit gluttony since Patrick also loves eating a lot of food, and Gary has been seen in a ton of episodes to eat a ton of food. Plus the episode, Have You Seen This Snail? Gary actually runs away because he's not being fed. So this could also fit them in the gluttony. Some fans think Spongebob could fit lust since he is so loving, but he has been confirmed by Nickelodeon to represent positivity and optimism, opposites of sin, making it unlikely that he represents any of the seven deadly sins. Ah, blow me! Additionally, his love for the world is genuine and not sexual in nature. The Drug Theory the drug theory states that five of the characters are each addicted to a different drug. Now there are several versions of this theory, popularized after a parody called Spongebong Hemp Pants was created. Are you ready, stoners? Oh! <coughs> Hold on, gay! <coughs> Spongebob is supposed to represent shrooms. Spongebob has a wild imagination similar to the mindset of somebody tripping on shrooms. He can go from extreme happiness, which is a good trip, to complete despair and fear, a bad trip. He is also usually very happy as shrooms create euphoria. Mr. Krabs and Mrs. Puffs are addicted to medical cocaine. According to this site, cocaine users can be irritable and paranoid. Mr. Krabs is very irritable when it comes to his riches, but also paranoid about his formulas being stolen. Mrs. Puff is irritable when she has to deal with Spongebob. Now, what do you do next? Blow it? Yes. No! No! And has almost PTSD-like bursts of paranoia about crashing a boat. Both of them are also very intense. Now, Squidward is heroin. 
Now, according to a drug site, heroin abusers have many behavioral tendencies matching Squidward's traits. These include lying and other deceptive behaviors, bad performance in jobs, and also avoided eye contact. Also, he is constantly moody and upset. Patrick is marijuana. Patrick is usually laid back, relaxed, and has a relatively positive outlook on life. He also eats a ton, which is obviously the munchies, so I could see where that one is. Hey, put some clothes on! Woohoo! Right on, Squidward! This theory also states that Sandy is against the others. As most viewers know, Sandy can get very annoyed when SpongeBob and Patrick visit her because they are hyped up on drugs, supposedly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now we're moving on to the last Spongebob theory. The death theory. The death theory is a possible explanation for why many fans perceive as a negative change in Spongebob's personality from the fourth season onwards. He is initially an intelligent, capable character who is rather naive, but he becomes increasingly stupid as the show progresses. This theory suggests that old Spongebob died during the 2004 film's famous death scene. Since sponges can asexually reproduce babies that are like clones, it is quite possible that Spongebob actually replaced himself, and that's why Spongebob's personality changes and he never seems to age. Well, it looks like what everybody said about us is true, Patrick. You mean that we're attractive? No, that we're just kids. It also explains why he is increasingly stupid. He's basically just a little kid. Now. This death theory was later disproven by Steven Hillenberg, who stated that season 4 to the present are all prequel episodes for the first se three seasons and the first movie, and the second movie is also a prequel. And basically, um, this is a reason why he never becomes manager or anything, basically stayed the same after the first film. Because if you watch the first film, you'll understand like a lot of stuff happened in that movie, and it just did not carry on throughout the show, but apparently... Seasons one through three and the first movie is how it actually ends. And then everything that is coming out season four to the present to today is all supposedly a giant prequel, which I don't know. Like, I mean, hey, this guy's saying Steven Hillenberg, but dude, that just seems so weird to me. Like, I don't know. That does not compute in my brain. So anyways, that was all I have for today's episode. Um, let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you believed any of these. Let me know if you've ever heard of any of these theories. I'm sure a bunch of you have because I've definitely heard of all these. That's why I wanted to make the video. But anyways, other than that, um, appreciate you guys watching, like and subscribing, all that stuff. Comment below. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you want to see. If you want to see more of these, I got a couple more for movies, a couple more for video games. I got just some generic creepypasta stuff if you guys want to hear about that. But you guys got to let me know down below. Other than that, stay safe, be happy, get laid. And I'll see you guys soon. This is It's the motherfucking S P O N G D. You know I'm chilling with my buddy P A T. Patrick, Patrick, Patrick. Puff that smoke, buddy. Yeah. What's good, Squidward? Da, 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 da. So light them up. Puff and pass. We gon' hit the good shit till we fall on our ass. Smoke box the shit out of this pineapple. Ooh. Let's get this shit, motherfucker.